we've finally reached the stage where we're ready to tackle the band structures of three-dimensional crystals. We're going to do this in a series of three mini lectures. In this first lecture, we're going to look at what is arguably about the simplest three-dimensional solid you can imagine, and that is the primitive cubic structure of alpha polonium. In lecture two, we'll move on to other P-block elemental solids, including metals like aluminum and semiconductors like silicon. And then in third lecture, we'll go into the world of transition metal compounds and look at rhenium trioxide and the perovskite family. So, as always, the first question is, you know, how are we going to define our first Brewan zone, which contain the k-vectors, which is so critical for defining the band structure. In three dimensions, of course, we have three lattice vectors, a, b, and c, and we have the fractional coordinates, x, y, and z. Right? This relationship we've been using in our crystallographic descriptions of crystals. In reciprocal space, there's also going to be three reciprocal space lattice vectors, A star, B star, and C star. And those are defined as follows. So the A star vector is equal to the cross product of the B and C real space lattice vectors times by 2 pi divided by the volume of the unit cell. And we have similar relationships for B star and C star. And so you can see that if our real space lattice contains orthogonal lattice vectors, then the reciprocal space lattice is also going to contain orthogonal lattice vectors that have the same direction as the real space lattice vector. Because the cross product of two vectors is a vector that's perpendicular to those two vectors with a length that's equal to the area of the parallelogram defined by those two vectors. We're not going to concern ourselves too much with deriving these reciprocal space lattice vectors, but it's good to know where they come from. Now, a particularly easy one to grasp is the primitive cubic lattice, because the reciprocal space lattice is also a primitive cubic lattice. The special points in the first Brewan zone here are relatively easy to grasp from our earlier treatment of the two-dimensional square lattice. Right? Our first Brewan zone is a cube. The gamma point is at 0, 0, 0, the center of our cube. So the gamma point is always going to be at the center of the first Brewan zone. X is 1 half of the A lattice vector. M is 1 half of the A and B lattice vectors. Right? So we encountered those very same special points in our two-dimensional square lattice. And now we have one additional one, the R point, which is one half of all three reciprocal space lattice vectors. So let's see how those reciprocal space lattice vectors impact the phases of our orbitals in a real material. The simplest possible material you can have in three dimensions is arguably a primitive cubic metal, or sometimes called a simple cubic metal. And there is one element that takes this structure, and that would be alpha polonium. So what I show here is the calculated band structure for alpha polonium with the simple cubic structure. Here we've gone to uh, DFT calculations, which is what we're going to use for the rest of this chapter and beyond. And generally, by convention, we're going to set the zero energy to be at the Fermi level. And that's different than what we were doing in the extended Huckel calculations we have been using so far. There's one polonium atom per unit cell. And polonium is a p-block metal. Right? So that means that it has a valence shell s and three p orbitals. It's the 6s and the 6p orbitals. And that's why we see four bands in our band structure. And without knowing anything really about orbital overlap, you should be able to recognize that this lower energy band here comes from the 6s orbital, while the upper three bands arise from the 6p orbitals. Let's look at the orbital overlap, first with the 6s orbital. All right, so at the gamma point, 
all of the atoms must have the same phase as we go from one unit cell to the next. Right? Our basis set here is just a single atomic orbital, the 6s orbital on polonium. And that gives rise to six nearest neighbor bonding interactions, and that is the lowest point in the 6s band. If we go to X, the phases of the orbitals are going to change as we move along the X axis, but not in the Y or Z direction. And so now, of the six nearest neighbors of polonium, two, those in the X direction, are going to be antibonding, and the other four are still going to be bonding. So the energy still is net bonding, but it's higher in energy than gamma. When we go to M, it means that the phases of the orbitals are going to change every time we translate a unit cell vector in either the x or the y direction. And so we get a crystal orbital that looks like this one. You can see now that the four nearest neighbors in the xy plane are all antibonding, but the two nearest neighbors in the z direction are still bonding. So this is more antibonding than bonding and higher energy still. And finally, when we go to R, we change the phase of the orbitals every time we translate by a unit cell vector in any of the three directions. And so that gives us this crystal orbital, where now all six nearest neighbor interactions have become antibonding. And that's the highest energy crystal orbital in the 6s band. This structure, it could have been pretty easily extrapolated from what we learned in one and two dimensions, just looking at these hydrogen atom sheets. Now let's consider the 6p orbitals. Start with the 6px. Right, let's look at the overlap at gamma. We see, just like we did with our fluorine atom chain, that the sigma interaction between p orbitals is going to be antibonding. Okay, so this is going to be at a relatively high energy. And if you look at the gamma point, you would see that all three p orbitals are degenerate. They all have the same energy, which is this antibonding sigma interaction. When we go to x, now when we translate in the x direction, we change the phase of our orbitals. So you can see that the orbitals have become sigma bonding and so the energy should drop. If we go to M, now we change the phase of the orbitals in the X and the Y direction. So if you look at these orbitals on the back face of our unit cell, you'll notice they have a different phase than at the X point. But the sigma interactions are still anti-bonding here. And finally, when we go to R, we see that we've changed the phase of the orbital every time we translate by one unit cell vector. This also is a sigma antibonding interaction. Now, of the 3p bands that we see up there, which one of those is the 6px band? Is it band 1, band 2, or band 3? Why don't you make a note of that? Well, the answer is not too hard to discern because we can see that when we went to the X point, we went from sigma antibonding to sigma bonding. And so that should have corresponded to a substantial drop in the energy. And only one of the three bands dropped on going from gamma to X. So this band number one is our 6px band. It makes sense that this 6px band would be high in energy at gamma and relatively low at the other K points. But what is responsible for the fact that it's lowest at X and then goes uphill when we go to M and then uphill again a little bit when we go to R? And to understand that, we need to think of the weaker pi interactions between these 6p orbitals. You can see at both gamma and X that the pi interactions with the four neighbors are bonding. But when we go to M, then we can see that along the Z direction, the pi interaction is still bonding, but along the y direction, the pi interaction is now antibonding. So the net would be a non-bonding state. And then when we get to R, 
we can see that the pi interactions in both directions perpendicular to the 6px orbital are antibonding. So that's responsible for this subtle rise of the 6px band from x to m to r. Right. Now the other p bands are not all on top of the 6px band, and we can see why if we look at the orbital overlap in the 6pz band. So here would be the overlap at gamma. Right. We can see this sigma antibonding character and pi bonding character. Here's the overlap when we go to x. All right, so when we go to x, now just as before, we're going to change the phases of the orbitals that are displaced by one unit cell in the x direction. So all of these orbitals on this right-hand face of the unit cell are different in phase. But notice that because it's a 6pz orbital, we still have a sigma antibonding interactions everywhere. So the 6pz orbital does not go down in energy when we go from gamma to x. If we go to M, we now change phases in both the X and Y directions. And when we finally go to the R point, we have a, a change in phase every time we translate by one unit cell in any direction. And we're back to this sigma bonding, pi antibonding interaction. So at R and at gamma, all three orbitals are degenerate. But at the other points, uh, they're not and that's simply because of the directionality of the p orbitals. So which of these three bands is the pz orbital? Hopefully you can see that it's band number three, right? Because at gamma, x, and m, it's going to be sigma star. So that's going to be a, a relatively high energy. And only band three does that. It goes up from gamma to x to m because the pi interactions are going from bonding to non-bonding to antibonding. And then it drops sharply when we go to the R point. And we can kind of put this all together for the band structure of polonium. We didn't look at the orbital overlap in the PY direction, but by default you should see that this band right here is the PY band. One thing to note, and we're going to see this again and again, is that at gamma, in general, the s orbitals oftentimes have a bonding overlap, and the p orbitals have an antibonding overlap, and there's a large energy separation between the two. The other thing we can think about is the placement of our Fermi level. Right, polonium is in group 16, so that means it has six valence electrons, so the six s orbitals are going to be filled, and then we have four electrons to go into the six p orbitals. So these p bands should be two-thirds filled, and that's what gives us the Fermi energy where it is. Now, if we were to move one element to the left, that is to a smaller atomic number, to bismuth, then we would have three valence shell p electrons. And that means that the p orbitals would be half-filled. Remember we saw with our hydrogen atom chain that a half-filled band is susceptible to a distortion. In one dimension, that distortion is called a Peierls distortion. And we see in bismuth metal something of a Peierls distortion. It has a structure that's rhombohedral, but it's not that far from primitive cubic. What's happened is that there's been a distortion to a structure where each bismuth atom has three short contacts with neighboring bismuth atoms, and I've indicated those here with solid lines. That contact is 3.07 angstroms. And then we have three longer contacts that are shown here with dashed lines, and those bonds have a distance of 3.53 angstroms. So it's not that far from a simple cubic, but because of the half filling, we get a distortion that's going to lower the energy of the occupied 6p bands at the expense of the unoccupied 6p bands. One final note before we leave the electronic structure of polonium and bismuth is that these are very heavy elements, and so there's actually a lot of spin-orbit coupling. And if we include spin-orbit coupling in our calculations, it's going to change them in a pretty substantial way.
it will remove the degeneracy of the 6p orbitals at gamma and at r. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind in real materials.